Good morning once again. Welcome to Christian History and Missions on BC 201. Today we are going to look at certain revivalists who, who lived for God. Let's look into their lives. So even before we could um, start, begin with our session, can I request one of us to lead us in prayer? Anyone, it can be Anita, Paul, Lubega, anyone. Let's pray. <clears throat> yes. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. Lord, it's not because of power almighty, but because of your grace. Lord, we really know that we are here because of your purpose and because of your kingdom and the expansion of everything that you planned for our life. Lord, as, a, as we attend this equipping class for our destiny and for our real purpose in life, Lord, please bless us, bless the teacher. Lord, let us not be only hearers of the word, but let us be also doers. And let us also develop other disciples after this class, Lord. We do also, Lord, bless our teacher. Let her be used as a vessel to portray and to communicate real, Lord, that you want, you want us to understand and be communicated to. Lord, we also pray for our colleagues who are not yet in class. Lord, we do pray that they are of good health and of good wealth in the name of Jesus Christ we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Lubega. Okay. Let me share the presentation with you. Okay, so everyone can see the presentation. So today we are going to talk about Dwight L. Moody, who was a revivalist with a common touch. So we see Moody was born in 1837, a few months before Queen Victoria began her reign. And he died in December 1899, just nine days before the uh, turn of a century. So his father died when Moody was about four years old, leaving back nine children for his mother to take care. So Betsy had to raise them. His mother never encouraged D.L. Moody to read the Bible, and he only acquired the equivalent of a fifth grade education. Because Moody was not only a product of his age, but also a herald of a new one. So we see that he pioneered techniques of evangelism that remain largely unchanged even today. He proclaimed a new eschatology of premillennialism and fostered a new ecum ecumenical spirit. So we see that as one ponders Moody's deprived rural boyhood and his career as an evangelist and educator and his role as a father, he quickly sheds the image of a Victorian antique and emerges as a real person. So keeping that in mind, let's look at his early childhood for us to know more about him. We see that he was struck out on his own at age 17, and he was a person who sold shoes in his uncle's Boston store. He also attended YMCA and a Sunday school classes where he became a Christian at the age of 18. Shortly after that, he moved to Chicago, where he sold shoes and worked towards his goal of amazing of a fortune of $1 million. 
So it slowly dawned on Moody that in light of his new faith, his life should not be spent on amazing wealth or as much as on helping the poor. So in 1858, he established a mission Sunday school at North Market Hall in a slum of Chicago. So it soon blossomed into a church from which a six years later was formed the Illinois Street Independent Church. And now it is known as Moody Memorial Church. So in 1861, he had left his business to concentrate on uh, fully on the ministry, on the evangelical work. So he drew the children of the German um, and Scandinavian migrant underclass to his mission with candy and pony rides. And he drew the adults through evening prayer meeting and English classes. So he was convinced, if you can really make a man believe you love him, you have won him. And that's uh, where he met. And uh, during this ministry time is where he met and married um, uh, the Sunday school teacher, Emma C. Revel, with whom he had three children. So as a president of the Chicago of YMCA for about four years, he championed evangelistic, uh, evangelistic and he distributed the tracts all over the city and he held daily noon prayer meetings. So during the Civil War, he refused to fight, saying, in this respect, I am a Quaker. But he worked through the YMCA and the United States Christian Commission to evangelize the Union troops. So he relentlessly sought and received financial support for all his projects from rich Christian businessmen who helped him during his time. So we see that Moody also believed music would be a valuable tool in his evangelical campaigns. So when in 1870, he heard Ira Sankey sing at a YMCA convention, he convinced Sankey to give up a well-playing government career to join him on the sawdust trail. So in summer 1873, we see that Moody and Sankey were invited to the British Isles by evangelical Anglicans William Pennefather and Cuthbert Brainbridge. But both sponsors died before Moody and Sankey arrived. So without official endorsement, Moody and Sankey held campings in New York. Sunderland and Jarrow to minimal crowds. So in Newcastle, the evangelical effort began to reap converts. From then on, their popularity escalated. So what happened? Immediately calls for crusades were poured in. During these crusades, Moody pioneered many techniques of evangelism. A house to house canvas of resident prior to a crusade, an ecumenical approach, enlisting cooperation from all local churches. And we also see evangelical lay leaders, regardless of denominational affiliations, uh, then philanthropic support by the business community. We also see the rental of a large central building and the showcasing of a, a gospel soloist and the use of an uh, inquiry room for those wanting to repent. So he, we see that he used every opportunity to preach the word of God. And when the managers of, of the 1893 World Exhibition in Chicago decided to keep the fair open on Sundays, many Christian leaders called for a boycott, not moody. He said, let us open so many preaching places and present the gospel so attractively that people will want to come and hear it. 
On one single day, over 1,30,000 people attended evangelistic meetings coordinated by Moody. So he had a call. Along with this call, God also gave him the wisdom how to strategically conduct the crusades and the meetings, which in turn was a blessing, which in turn made people to give more priority to such meetings and be saved in them. So when people were attracted to the meeting, it was was not something very flowery that he attracted, but then the word of God attracted them. The word that he preached in these crusades transformed the people. And yes, the word transformed them and ministered to them. And we see that drew many others to these crusades. Well, finally, in 1886, we see that Moody started the Bible Work Institute of the Chicago Evangelization Society. And one of the first in the Bible school movement from this work, he launched yet another work, the Corporate Association, which is later known as Moody's Press. So an organization using horse-drawn gospel wagon from which students sold low-cost religious books and tracts throughout the nation. So despite a tireless schedule, he preached six sermons a day just a month before he died. So from this, what we understand, we see that he carried an untiring spirit within him, the passion that he, uh, uh, that he carried within himself to share the word of God inspires even today. Many leaders are inspired with the passion that he carried. So we see that he loved to spend time with his children and grandchildren. That means he had a family time at Northfield, Massachusetts farm, even before he could die. But at the same time, he died with a great passion of spreading the word to everyone. So he, he did fight a good fight. He did keep the call that God has called him for. With that, we will move on to the next person. Let me change the slide to the next person. OK, the, these are uh, some of the crusades. Just give me a minute. Let me share some of the pictures so that you all can take a look. OK. Everybody, OK, they're not able to see it. Just give me a minute. Sorry, guys, I don't know what happened. Let me present it again. I feel this way is good. If I enlarge it to change the slide, it becomes difficult. So maybe now it's easy for me to show you. Yeah. So these were some of the meetings that he had. These were the crusades, the big crusades. I don't know how they managed to build such a big auditorium or a theater style. It's quite big. D.L. Moody with his orphanage children. OK, with that, we will move on to the next person, William and Catherine Booth. OK, everyone, you're able to see that. Great. So we're going to talk now about William and Catherine Booth. So William Booth was born in Nottingham on April 10th, 1829. He was the son of a Samuel Booth and his, and his second wife, Mary Nemos, both from Derbyshire. So the early age of William Booth was, uh, as he was born in Nottingham, he had three sisters. And Emma and Mary, and an elder brother, Henry, who died on his second birthday. So writing about his father, William said, my father was a grab. OK, my father was a grab, a get. He had been born into poverty. He determined to grow rich, and he died. He grew very rich because he lived without God and simply worked for money. And when he lost it all, his heart broke with it and he died miserably. You see? So in 1842, when he was age 
13, his father sent him to work as an apprentice to Francis Emmes in a pawn broker's shop situated in the poorest part of Nottingham. Nottingham. So he disliked his job, but it was through his work that his social conscience was stirred and he became aware of the plight of the poor. So in September the very same year, his father Samuel became ill and died. Though not before making a dead uh, deathbed repentance, shortly after his mother had to leave the house in Sinnington for a small shop in one of the poor quarters of the same place where she earned a meager income selling toys, needles, cotton and, uh, and other things to manage or take care of her family. So it was in the open street that this great change passed over him. So it was this time that William started attending Broad Street Wesley Chapel, that is the Methodist Church. In uh, 1844, he had a conversion experience, nothing that. It was in the open street of Nottingham that his great change passed over me, he says that. So in 1846, he was impressed by the preacher of the Reverend James from America and David Greenbury from Carsburg, encouraged by uh, a Greenbury to join a group of fellow believers who preached in the streets. So he delivered his first sermon in Kid Street. Eventually, Booth stopped working at the pawnbroker and was out for a, uh, and uh, and was out of work for a year so that's when um, you know he happened to meet uh, um, the partner for his life so in 1849 we see william moved to london to find work briefly returning to pawn brokering but also joining a chapel in Clapham's. So through this church, he was introduced to his future wife, Catherine Mumford. So after uh, becoming an evangelist in the Methodist New Connections, they married on July 16, 1855, uh, forming a formidable and complementary lifelong partnership. So what happened following a brief honeymoon, we see that he was appointed to circuit in Halicaf and Gateshead, but finding his structure restrictive and feeling himself called to be an itinerant evangelist, he resigned in 1861. So four years later, we see that William and Catherine moved back to London, and it was here that William commenced his first open-air evangelical camping in a white chapel, preaching in a tent. So this ministry led to the formation of Christian mission with Booth as its leader. We see that in 1878, the Christian mission was renamed as the Salvation Army, which is widely known across the nations. So generally, Booth, uh, as he was known then, summed up for the purpose of his body in the following way. Like, we are a salvation people. This is our speciality for getting saved and keeping saved. And then getting somebody else saved. But there was, there was, uh, uh, like, they, uh, but there was uh, to be a frequent opposition to the army's methods and principles in the early age. So in August 1904, William Booth always had an eager to make use of this new technology. So he commenced his first motor tour, traveling from Land's End to Aberdeen. And six more motor tours followed. Then in spring of 1905, he entered to Australia and New Zealand. And General William Booth visited the Holy Land where he visited many sites of the uh, biblical significance. And he conducted many uh, evangelical crusades there. So in August 17, 1912, there was a war. 
uh, war cry report that the general was not so well. So three days later, uh, following a terrific thunderstorm had occurred just prior to passing away of the army's mother 22 years before, the old warrior finally laid down his sword. So we see that in a public memorial service, he arranged at Olympic on the following Wednesday. People uh, uh, There were about 35,000 people who attended, including Queen Alexander, who came uh, incognito, and uh, representatives of the King George V and Queen Mary was present in that evangelical meeting that he conducted in that place. We also see that. Uh, uh, he left a legacy from uh, through the Salvation Army, where many uh, uh, many people uh, many people were saved and many leaders were raised. So one such leader whom we see is Smith Wigglesworth, was raised through his meeting. Okay, um, yeah. So with that, we will end on. Salvation Army or William Booth. Yeah. So during uh, William Booth, during his lifetime, the work of the Sa Salvation Army was now established in 58 countries. And William Booth also wrote extensively and composed several songs. So his book, uh, In Darkest England and the Way Out, released in 1890, became a bestseller. So it became the guideline for Salvation Army's approach to social welfare. OK, with that, I leave with a quote. I'm not waiting for a move of God. I am a move of God. There are several other quotes of William. But these are the few that I chose. If there's anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it is because God has had all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. So with that, we will move on to Amy Carmichael, who was a missionary in India. Are we able to see that? Yes. So Amy Carmichael, she uh, we see that uh, she lived during the time of 1867 to 1951, and she was born in Ireland. So in 1892, Amy uh, began by volunteering with China Inland Mission, but was refused due to the health reasons. Later, she spent about two years in Japan and Sri Lanka, which is known as Ceylon, during that time. So in November 1895, she came to South India, never to return to her homeland, and, uh, and uh, spent the next 55 years of her life serving in India. So when we look at her dedication and we see the primary work uh, that she established uh, in India was by running an orphanage in Donavar. The orphanage rescued and cared for the young girls who had been uh, temple girls and forced to become temple prostitutes. So later, the orphanage accepted boys as well because the need was so huge. So she wrote many books about her work as a missionary in India. When she, um, when she was asked, what is missionary life like, Amy responded, missionary life is simply a chance to die, where you get to die to yourself every day. So the work she started continues even today. And we get to know about it more through the website that this uh, orphanage has as donavarfellowship.org.in. So for more information, we can log into it and know about her ministry. Well, with that, we will move on to the next person who is called as an angel of mercy, Dr. Ida S. Kadda. So Dr. Ida 
hopeful name is Ida Sophia Scudder, and she was born in Rani Pet, Tamil Nadu. India on December 9th, 1870. Her parents, John and Sophia, were American medical missionaries and they were second ge generation missionaries. So as John's father, also named John, was also a doctor and a missionary in India. So we see that Ida grew up in Tamil Nadu, where she witnessed the beautiful celebration of life as well as famine, disease, and poverty. So as a teenager, she was invited to attend, attend a private Christian boarding school in Massachusetts called Northfield, where she earned a reputation of her pranks. So after graduation, she planned to get married and settle down in US. She was determined never to come uh, become a third generation missionary in India because she's seen how difficult it is um, how difficult it is to do the mission work in india because it was not developed it was not in the way it is today so but god had other plans for her so in 1890 we see that her mother became ill so she had to travel back to india for a few months to help her dad run this clinic and take care of her mother so one night everything changed you see that in middle of the night a man came running to their home begging for someone to care for his wife who was struggling in childbirth you see ida was a teenager with no medical training so she went to fetch her father but because of the uh, culture tradition that separated men and women the man refused to allow another man to treat her, to treat his wife. So his words were something to effect of it. It would be better that she die than to be seen by another man, than to be seen by a man. So Ida was mortified that she could do nothing and threw herself in prayer and wrestling with God about her life and her call. Well, on the same night, two other men came to her parents' bungalow with the exact same request and departed with the same response. Well, the next morning, she was horrified to learn that all three mothers and their babies had died. So all because there was no female doctor available to them. And this very situation, or in this moment, she gave up all thoughts of a marriage and a comfortable life. She gave up on a future dream that she carried. We see that later in a book she writes, I think that was the first time I saw God face to face. And all the time it seemed that he was calling me into this work. You see that first ponder, and then she did. Know your facts, count the cost. Money is not an important thing. What you are building is not a medical school. It is a kingdom of God. So don't err on the side of being too small. What we see with Ida here is she looked the call as God's assignment. She never looked at her ability what she is able to achieve or what she is able to do. When the assignment is of God's, we don't have to see how big or how able are we. When it is, when the assignment is from God, we need to trust that it is God's work and God will do it. We need to be available just to execute it in and through us. Just see what we can do it. But then allow God to do what he can do.
So here we see that Haida Skara, uh, you know, uh, right now she is the founder of the Christian Medical College, which is known as CMC Velour, and it is associated with the other hospitals. But a legal is far greater than the institution and its building. What she has achieved is much greater. So the work was not very easy. But she has crossed many hurdles to achieve what she has done. So one thing that we need to know is we need to rely on God for his assignment. And this is how the CMC Bellord looks. This is a big uh, place. It's much bigger than what we could see right now in the picture. This is the hospital where uh, this whole hospital itself is uh, like a city in itself. So the Velour is known for this hospital, CMC Velour, where we see people from all over the world, or especially in India, been drawn to this place. We see the doctors from all over the world come here to practice. And we hear that all the doctors, the nurses, and the staff who serve there carry the spirit of missionary, carry the servant heart. How did that happen? The seed that God planted through Ida Skader is still been growing through many other leaders in that place. We see that this place which God has erected in India at CMC Velour is being a blessing to many other people in India. The very thing that she noticed where she saw because of uh, the loss of a, 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 you know, a, a women doctor or a women a medical professional in that area, in that place, three mothers and the three babies were lost. And this stirred her heart. And this very cry, the genuine cry from her heart, God heard and birthed a ministry there. You see, this building is still standing strong. This work is still continue, continuing. So what God does, he takes over. He makes sure that it runs in the way that it was planted. The mission work in this place is still continuing. With that, we will move on to the next person, John G. Lake. So John G. Lake is also known as the Jesus Healer, uh, or a man of healing. So they say that if there was a man ever, a man who walked in the revelation of God as man, it was John G. Lake. A man of purpose, a man of vision, a man of strength, and a man of character. We see that in um, in one goal in life was to bring the fullness of God to every person. So he often said that the secret of heaven's power was not in doing, but in being. He believed that spirit-filled Christians should enjoy the same type of ministry that Jesus did while he was living on earth. And that this reality could only be accomplished by seeing themselves as God saw them. So here we see that John G. Lake lived his life and fulfilled his ministry in the earth with a type of spiritual understanding. So if we could just grasp the reality of our position through Jesus Christ, as Lake did, every nation would ring with the praises of God. And he was responsible for raising one lakh converts. Sorry, it is 10 lakh converts, 625 churches, and 1,250 preachers in, in his five years of ministry. It is definitely the Lord's doing. Because of his resurrection revelation, he had a deadly plague germ and he died in the hand at the, at the start of his ministry, though one could only be healed in Dr. Dovey's healing home. So we see that is in his ministry, we see that many were healed. 
To look at his, keeping this as a background, let's look at his early age. He was born on March 18th. 1870 in Ontario, Canada, where he was uh, from a very small uh, family which moved to Michigan in the United States. While he was still young, you see that Lake attended a Salvation Army meeting and he became convicted with his need for a savior. And he invited Jesus to become Lord of his life. And we see that Lake was incredibly impacted by illness. So he was one of the 16th child and over the course of his young life, eight of them died. He grew to hate the sickness, grief and death that was so much part of his family. So Lake felt a call to the ministry and studied to become a Methodist minister. So he took the heart, the Methodist teaching on sanctification and he followed it very passionately. When the studies were done, however, he made a decision to go into a business and start a newspaper in Illinois. And then he moved back to Michigan and began a career in real estate. And that's where he met Jenny Stephen and he married her. So the sickness still continued to haunt Lake. We see that his brother was invalid and one sister had extensive cancer and other sister had bleeding problem and his wife had tuberculosis and heart disease. You see the situation that he is in? Well, in 1899, the family had heard about John Alexander Dewey in Chicago because he was receiving substantial media attention back then and then he took Lake's brother to the healing room in Chicago and he was instantly healed. And then both sisters then went as well and they were also healed. Now finally Lake had contacted people to pray for his wife in June 1899 and here comes even she was healed. You started to open the scriptures to see in Acts 10, 38. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, which says, You know Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And he saw outlined clearly for himself that Jesus is the healer and Satan is the oppressor of men. So Lake became a uh, so with this Lake came to a decision like he witnessed himself of this healing where his brother, his sister, and his wife has been healed. And he came to the knowledge of Christ and saying that Jesus, like how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, if God can anoint. Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power for which he went about doing good and healing who were oppressed by the devil, the same God can do it in and through me. So immediately he joined Doe's Christian Catholic Church and he branched, um, you know, he started serving and ministering there. And we see that he uh, gradually Lake, uh, grew to become a deacon in this new church. So in 189 uh, in August 1900 Lake's wife Jenny was accidentally shot uh, by a four-year-old son following Doe's teaching Lake refused medical help and depended on prayer the event was so startling an article was written up in the Chicago Daily Tribune which regularly reported on Doe's activities well, in 1904, Lake moved to Chicago to work with Dewey, seeing the power of God. So the Lake began to cry out for more of the Holy Spirit. We see that there's an urge and thirst and passion growing within him for more of Holy Spirit because he knew that uh, only through the Holy Spirit that he could move with the power of God. And he spent nine months seeking a fuller level of the presence of God. And then Lake went with another man to pray for a sick woman. We see the God's presence fell on her and over like him and he never knew before. 
The next six months, we see that he never marked by conviction, repentance, or heart, heart cleansing. The gifts of the Spirit began to manifest in his ministry, and he went about healing people. At one point, Dovi listed his accomplishment and told him, if you were ever developed constructive qualities equal to your critical capacity, you will be a greater man than I am. So we see that uh, John G. Lake knew that he would have to start his own work. He felt that he was called to Africa. And he went there in 1808. There was a short term pastoring stint in Indianapolis. Over a five-year period in South Africa, Lake saw about 10 lakh converts planted hundreds of churches and raised over 1,000 local ministers. The work was so strenuous, however, uh, and his wife died in uh, 19, not December 1908, and he committed to keep his family together. So in 1913, we see that Lake returned to the States with his seven children. So once he returned to States, he married and began traveling on ministry work again. And one of the places he was asked to speak was in Washington. And he was asked to start a healing room, for which he agreed. And over an approximately five-year period, um, he has healed about uh, one lakh people were reported that they were healed in this ministry. And although Lake's church was never large, th but thousands came from all over the country and the world to receive prayer. So in 1920, he felt uh, God, uh, God has called to move to Portland, Oregon, and start a healing room ministry there. Similarly, the healing uh, followed in his ministry. We see that Lake considered to start a healing room ministry in towns, uh, in different places, and God moved powerfully in his ministry. And we see that uh, healing was, uh, he was known for the healing ministry wherever he ministered in the place. So uh, in on September 15, 1935, he died. Yeah, with that, we end on John G. Lake. And some of the quotes of John was, when I saw for the first time by the word of God that sickness was not the will of God, everything in my nature rose up to defeat the will of devil. Yeah. So with that, we end this class today. And in the next class, we can start up with the uh, 20th and 21st centuries revivals and its moment, what happened there, back then. So uh, open up to the class. If there's anything that you would like to share, uh, it would be good to unmute and share. Was there anything that impacted your life? How the Lord ministered to the people whom we looked into them today on John G. Lake or Haida Scudder, Amy Carmichael, William Booth, Yel Moody? Okay, let's pray. God is the same God who touched those leaders, raised them. The same God can minister to you and me. As we are in this class, as we are looking into each one's life, they, uh, they are the common people, normal people, just like you and me, who attended one or the other ministries, and they heard about God. The Spirit of the Lord uh, started working in and through them. The fire that was uh, sown into them, the seed that was sown into them, started burning to do something for God. Or some incidents, just like how Ida Skado went through, triggered to, uh, to branch out a ministry that is still ongoing. We see how God could stir our heart 
even through the situation that we are in. No matter where we are, friends, we are not there by mistake. God has allowed that situation. God has put us there in the middle of that situation for us to birth something new into Him. The purpose, the call of God to be birthed in and through us. So every situation, let's look at God saying, God, that is a reason that you have allowed that I am here in this place, the situation. Father, I pray that you reveal it to me. Let this become our prayer. Let this become our prayer. Let's seek God this time and ask God, God, you speak to me. You minister to me. Friends, let's make this class very different. We have another five minutes. Let's seek God in prayer. If God is ministering, to you or through you to someone in our class. Allow the Lord to flow, speak to you. As God speak to me, give me a word, give me a purpose, show me the things, make it clear, clear. Let me speak, let me release the word of wisdom to somebody else in the class. Let's speak and release it to each other. Class, can we just pray together and ask God to speak and move in and through us? Let's pray. Let's pray and ask God, God, let's take this time and ask God, yes, Lord, minister to us, Lord Jesus. Show us the way, Lord. Clear our path, oh Father. Help us to realize and recognize the purpose that you have called for. Yes, Lord. No hurdles can stop, no obstacles are big for God. The sovereign God is with us. He is confirming to each of us here in the class that He is upholding your right hand and He is leading you. He is a God who is higher, who is greater, who is mightier. He is leading us to the rock that is much greater than who we could think. As you're in the class, if you've been led, you can just unmute and speak what the Lord is sharing or showing or helping you to sense things. You can unmute and release it to our class. Is there anyone receiving a word? You can just unmute and share it among your friends in the class. It may be that God is speaking to each other through you. It may be a word of blessing, word of comfort, word of confirmation, word to stare each one, word to build each one. You can just unmute and release that word, release that rhema word, because the word has the power to break, to repair, and to build. Sugar. I see some of us praying and asking God, God, give me your wisdom. Give me your wisdom to do what you have called me to do. And here I see that Jesus is that wisdom. Jesus has become the wisdom of God to you and me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you bless us week after week. We pray that, Lord, you will stir our heart. Every seed that you sow in our heart will not go void, but it will accomplish the purpose that it was sent for, the Father. Your word has the power. Your word has the power to break, to repair, and to build. Lord, I surrender each of us in your hand. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the call and the purpose that you have blessed each one of us with. I pray that you will strengthen each one, O oh Father, to look up to you, to trust you in every area, Lord, and hold on to you, O oh Father, because you are the Lord who will lead us, O oh Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, God, who was faithful to accomplish your call and purpose on all the revivalists whom we studied on. The same God is living inside of us, and the same God is leading us to that great rock. Thank you, Father, that you are a God who is faithful. You are the God who is faithful. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We don't rely on our understanding, on our knowledge, on our wisdom. But then, Lord, yes, we rely on you, on your understanding, on your wisdom. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. And God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Hope it was a, a time of blessing and encouraging us to do what God has called us to do. Thank you and God bless.